This is Rob Carbone, and you're listening to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. is going on guys this is rob carbone coming at you with another episode of bd4 where there is no better way to get your yankees and knicks analysis hope everybody's doing well episode 122 tonight guys 122 of bd4 um you know we're going to keep focusing on these uh these sleeper prospects these uh prospects that are lower on the board And then, like I said, uh, we will work our way up to the more exciting prospects in this draft. You know, the more well-known names. But hey, for now, we've got to keep uh, working on these potential sleepers, potential, you know, uh, know, lower-grade prospects. And we've got Grant Riller to break down tonight uh, in just a little bit. But yeah, man, I hope everybody's doing all right. You know, it's it's, um, the same shit, really, in this quarantine uh, not much has has changed um fucking i need a haircut and uh somebody somebody made a comment when i posted episode 121 on uh twitter twitter yeah last night it was on twitter somebody you know go find a barber and i can't yeah i can't disagree with you man um listen it, it's yeah, I, I've been growing my shit out because there's nothing that's open. So it's it's just a mess right now up here. And I just, at this point, you know, I'm at the point where I just stop doing my hair. I just do that and then that's it. Out of the shower, I just fucking w- w- let it fly. Whatever whatever happens with it happens. <laughs> that's how lazy I've been getting during this lockdown, guys. I've got nothing to do. I've been so lazy, so... Yeah, we're just going to keep working on the podcast, you know, keep pumping out episodes, keep doing show after show, pretty much on a nightly basis. <laughs> Fuck, there's nothing. I need something in life um, just to talk about. There's UFC on, you know, I've been watching a little bit of that, so that's good. There's something there, right? That's some live event. I love that. Um, but, you know, if I was a big UFC fan, that would be huge for me, but I'm not. But I've still been catching it just because it's something. It's it's live, right? Um, ESPN, actually, you know, speaking of ESPN, they're the ones playing UFC. Speaking of them, they're actually, they put out a top, top something. I don't know if they're like top 70 something players of all time, um, NBA players of all time. And I know people always complain no matter what, when, when it comes to that type of shit. And I never like that. I always hate how fans just complain over everything. But boy, do I tell you, I've got to agree. I agree with the NBA fan base in this one. Some of these rankings are just absurd. And I I was joking. Jokingly, I put out a tweet or a post on Facebook, depending on where you follow me. Go do so. Um, I put out a post, I tweet, I said, what was this by like I, I brought to you by our 19 year old intern because that's honestly what I think it was. Yeah, you know, I, I this is like there were so many current players up on that list. You, you had Giannis at 27, really. You had James Harden in the top 50, you had Russell Westbrook right there, you had Steph Curry and Kevin Durant 12 and 13 in that order. Why are they even at high? It's well, it's just fucking, it's LeBron James second. 
and you know, not to knock any of these new age players, not to knock them at all. You know, I am an old school type of fan, but I, I respect all all ages. It's just there, guys, there are so many NBA greats from back in the day. So many. It's absurd how many there were. That it's really hard to put a current player whose career is not even halfway over yet above them, right? So I wouldn't even, you know, I would probably go at least 15 players in before I even start thinking about current guys. I don't know, but some of the the, the rankings on this list it was just fucking embarrassing. You know, I was embarrassed for whoever the hell made it. You know, if I was to make one, listen, it probably wouldn't be perfect either. But this was interesting. This was very poor. Um, you know, in my top five, I would probably have some. I wouldn't have. I don't know if I would have LeBron James. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think I would. I wouldn't have Jordan. I would have Jordan first. Um, I don't want to get into my own list, but you know, I would. It's. It wasn't even the top five that angered me. It was just a lot of the um, you know twenty to thirty guys who were who were there who shouldn't have been. Um, I know Shaq was top ten. Tim Duncan was eight. Some of these are just a little too much. Magic Johnson, great career. I wouldn't put him fifth all time. You know they just had some interesting, interesting picks like why guys who haven't even won a thing yet up there on that board. It was, whew. Yeah, I got a good laugh at it though. I'll give you that. ESPN. It made me chuckle a little bit. Um, now tonight we're not going to make our own, we're not going to make a top 50, whatever it was. We're, we're, we're going to keep, like I said, keep focusing on this little prospect profiling and try to finish up our lower grade prospects before we head up into the lottery and talk about the more exciting LaMelo balls of the world and Killian Hayes type of, of players. But we have, we've got Grant Riller tonight who we're going to dive into. Um, this is a kid. I think the big knock here is the numbers were remarkable, but the the knock here was his um his level of competition. He didn't really play against blue chip competition, right? He played again. He played for Charleston in the CAA, so he didn't really have those Duke type of teams, those Kentucky, Kansas, um, you know, clubs opposing him. So the competition, it, it, the level of competition is probably why he's a sleeper pick. Didn't play a ton of high-level teams. So that's that's why folks are sleeping on him. That's probably why you've never heard of him. Um, so Grant Riller is somebody we're going to dive into and break him down, talk about his strengths, his weaknesses, and why he may fit into the Knicks system. So we're going to take a really quick break. We're almost 10 minutes in. And as soon as we get back from break, guys, we're going to talk on Grant Riller. And yeah, like I just said, we'll talk on him and, and dissect him a little bit. All right, we'll be right back. Hey, fellas, really quick, I just want to remind you. In order to subscribe to BD4, to subscribe to my blog, and to follow me on social media, all you have to do is go to my website. That's it. Just go to nysportstalkrc.wordpress.com forward slash connect. Once again, that is nysportstalkrc.wordpress.com dot com forward slash connect once there guys that will display all of my information where to subscribe to the podcast how to subscribe to my blog and where to follow me on social media guys thank you so much and let's get back to the show Spent four years over there at Charleston, so he's he's somebody who's kind of old for his uh, you know first class, twenty three years old. So being a four year student there, he did miss out on some time. But listen, I think this this kid Riller is going to be he has the chance to be a solid NBA sixth man, um, combo guard, combo guard about six three 
190 pounds. Um, and yeah, he had a great senior season. He, he was good all four years, but he kept improving in his senior season, junior and season se junior and season. <laughs> Junior and senior seasons were best. Um, his senior year, though, he averaged this past year, he averaged 22 points, five rebounds, and four assists. Did so on a pretty efficient 50% from the field, 36% from three, and 83% from the free throw stripes. Um, now, the volume, he did this on 14.7 field goal attempts per game, 4.2 three-point attempts, and 6.9 free throw attempts per game. Uh, collected 1.6 steals and turned it over 3.1 times per game. Did this all across 34 minutes a night for 31 games. So good season for, for this kid. Again, it was the competition that people knock him for. And quite honestly, that 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 bugs me too. It wasn't really, you know, it, it it's a thorn in his side. And I understand it. it it's, it's always going to be in the back of my mind. Yeah, he dropped 22 something something, but it was against these lower grade teams. But hey, I would still take the chance on this kid. Does he fall to 27, which is where the Knicks are projected to draft um, with their second first round pick? You know, he would be a decent replacement for someone like Alonzo Trier, who is expected to leave in free agency, being that the Knicks did not play him enough this season. <laughs> Why? Uh, that's a whole nother conversation for a different day. But yeah, he would he would be a good replacement for Trier, you know, a uh, similar type of player who scores off the bounce provide some mid-range and occasional three-point shooting. And, you know, this kid's more ex more explosive, more athletic. Um, I've heard some comparisons, a bunch of them, really. But I think the one comp that stood out to me most when it came to Grant Riller was um, a fucking, uh, who was it? It was Darren Williams. That was the comparison that I really enjoyed. Now, I'm not saying that Grant Riller is going to end up like Darren Williams in his peak at his, at his prime. Um, but I do think he has that similar play style where he likes to shoot off the bounce. He's got a good, uh, mid range shot, a decent three point shot. And when he's hot, he's hot, right? A three level scorer, kind of like Darren Williams was, um, an athletic off the dribble, three level isolation scoring guard, you know, who's a potential sleeper pick in this draft with six man of the year upside. So likes to shoot off the bounce, likes to, uh, do a lot of things off the bounce, bounce he shoots off the bounce he finishes at the rim and slashes off the dribble effectively he can play make ball handle create shots for himself and his teammates um with the ball in his hands as well and you know he generates a lot of contact he, he does a lot of things with the ball so we'll start with the shooting you know that's the area where he's improved most um over his college career <clears throat> excuse me uh he likes that sidestep that step back shot too on the drive. Um, you know, he's got a good quick burst of speed, a good first step too. So he likes to stop on the dime and, and do a little step back or a side step and shoot it that way. That's where he's best as a shooter, you know, going downhill and, and just abruptly stopping and then pulling up. Um, he's got a capable catch and shoot game too. So don't get me wrong. It's just on low volume, very efficient, but on a low volume. Uh, I think he was in the 89th percentile, this year on spot up points per possession. So that was very effective. And over the course of his entire college career, Riller shot 40% from three point distance as a spot up shooter without taking dribbles. So over four years, he was 75 for 188 specifically, which uh, equals out to be just like 0.1% under 40. So very efficient as a catch and shoot guy, just does most of his damage off the uh, dribble, you know, a guy who likes to likes to dribble the ball and, and shoot contested shots at a pretty average rate. He will contest. He will shoot at a pretty you know, convert at a pretty decent rate when he's contested, and he can obviously make the uncontested shot attempts as well. So, very efficient shooting numbers. Despite a guy who is pretty small, despite a guy who likes to dribble, still very efficient, especially from inside the arc. Just under sixty percent from two point distance on just under nine attempts per game from two-point distance over four years, or exactly nine attempts. It was 8.9 attempts per game inside the arc on 59% from two-point. So, yeah, good three-level guy. Like I said, he doesn't always need the three. It's mostly mid-range and attack in the rim. And speaking of slashing and finishing, that's that's what we've got next on my little bullet-pointed list. Um, 
he can effect effectively drive and finish just because of that quick burst we mentioned because of how shifty he is with the ball and that fantastic first step and has very good acceleration um you know all all those four things help him get to the rim with ease and of course finishing at the rim he does that pretty effectively shooting over 60 percent this past season in the ra so um but you know most importantly you know aside from from that aside from his ability to slash um he's a great just a great ball handler, a great playmaker, and somebody who creates shots. That's huge. You know, the Knicks have been lacking that. Frankie Lakina doesn't have that aggressiveness yet. Has he improved aggressively in, inside that? You know, with his mentality, has he improved that? Yeah, sure. He definitely took a jump upwards this year, but he's not really that guy. You know, I don't think he's going to be that guy there either to be aggressive off the bounce and really playmake for his team. Alfred Payton, he ain't that guy. We know that. Um, and, and DSJ is just, guy's a fucking lost cause right now. He has no clue where he is as a player in the NBA. He needs some some help. Um, so the Knicks need that from their backcourt uh, guards, right? They need that playmaking ability, that, that ability to to penetrate off the bounce and, and, and create. And this is it. Griller, 87th percentile in terms of isolation points per possession. Uh, he was ranked in the 96th percentile as a pick-and-roll ball handler when it came to points per possession. So some good numbers this past season as just a ball handler, as a as a scorer in pick-and-roll. Um, really good. You know, some would say he's the, the best ball handler in his class. If not the best, he's definitely up there as one of the best. Um, you know, somebody who likes that. He loves that in-and-out move with his left hand to get around defenders in pick-and-roll. He does that pretty often. Again, he's shifty. He changes directions a lot. Um, changes speeds. Pretty crafty with the ball. High IQ. Good spin move. He has a spin move he likes to use. Good hesitation move when he's going downhill. Um, and in terms of his playmaking, in terms of like passing and stuff, I would like to think he's an overall a decent passer who's shown flashes to be a little bit more than decent. You know, he's a decent passer right now who's shown flashes that he can be... Um, you know, a well above average passer for for a, for a guard, uh, for a two guard or combo guard. Um, you know, he's especially good when passing to spot up guys in pick and roll, right? A lot of times when he's playing pick and roll, he doesn't often hit the screener. He, he's not really going to hit the roller all the time. He's going to kick it out to the spot up guys on the perimeter. That's where he shines best as a playmaker, I think. You know, and so overall at college, despite having a good assist rate this past season, did only average 2.8 per game across 32 minutes overall at Charleston. So right now I would say he's more of a more of a reactive passer than a proactive one. Hasn't taken that next step yet, but that's that's something I think that will and you know possibly could improve. You know, he's shown flashes. He's shown flashes of flashes of being a good cross court. Uh, passer, somebody who can make the skip pass or those live action passes. So now the last three positives I hear I have here. Um, we mentioned he gets to the line effectively. Um, this past year got to the line about seven times per game. Overall, though, across four seasons at Charleston, got to the line five times per game. Still very good. Um, he rebounds pretty decently for a guy of his size. I think it was. This year, really, where he took the step up and averaged his a career high um, of five. I think it was five point one. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on. Maybe he'll be a decent rebounder. Um, and then he's improving every year. Really, he went from thirteen points per game to nineteen, and then these past two years, he averaged uh, about twenty-two points in each. So somebody who has some potential here, as I really think this kid could be a good instant scorer off the bench. Somebody who could provide some pop you know, to a struggling offense. Um, now there are some weaknesses, obviously, you know, that's, that's why we're talking about him. Um, he's not perfect. Uh, he needs to be better without the ball in his hands. He's kind of ball dominant. Again, we mentioned he's an isolation scorer. So someone who's not going to really affect the game as a cutter. He was actually just 28th percentile um, in terms of points per possession off the cut this past season. Very poor, meaning 72% of the league was better than him. 
Uh, or I'm sorry, 72? I don't know. My fucking math is terrible. Whatever 100 minus 28 is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 72% of the league was better than him scoring off the gut. Uh, inconsistent defender in all areas pretty much. So his defense is pretty poor at times. And a lot of it is, you know, he's got the athleticism. We mentioned he's pretty explosive. He can move very well laterally, right? Side to side, he'll keep up with the quicker guards too. But it's the effort, it's the inconsistent motor defensively that's simply not there. It's not always there. Um, he, he'll get caught flat-footed at times. He will get caught ball-watching. So he's got to improve um, defensively. You know, fighting over screens, going under the screen, uh, it's... He's not somebody who's going to be very switchable, I don't think, especially due to that lack of size. He's going to have a lot of mismatches, and that lack of size is going to, you know, limit the lineup flexibility you have. If the Knicks were to draft him, they're going to they would have to play him, you know, in, in specific lineups, and he's not very flexible in that sense. But somebody who's going to be limited to guarding the smaller wings, right? Not really going to be able to guard the true threes or slide up a position. Um, now the last couple of cons here, he does need work going back to his offense. He does need work as a passer still, especially in pick and roll. Again, he, he hit the spot up guys often, but I want to see him connect with the roller more, right? Just connect. You know, if he was going to, to be drafted by the Knicks, I would love for him to, to kind of hit the rollers more and connect with Julius Randall with, with Mitchell Robinson, right? Out of PNR. That would be huge. He needs to work on that. So. Um, what else do I have? He's still a bit inconsistent as a shooter from the outside, uh, from his freshman senior uh, to senior season. When it came to his three point percentages, it went from thirty three percent in his freshman year to thirty nine his sophomore, back down to thirty three as a junior, and, and then uh, as a senior, thirty six percent. So kind of up and down, right, from below average to average, and so forth. Didn't really have consistency from uh, from three point distance on a season to season basis. Um, so that kind of, you know, he's going to come into the NBA with some question marks about his shooting. Could he be at least adequate? Maybe. Um, I think he can lack of a blue chip, you know, lack of blue chip competition, which we spoke on at the, at the top of the show played for, you know, for Charleston and the CAA. So no Duke, Kansas, Kentucky, none of those elite teams. Um, so were those college numbers, you know, those 22 points per game, was that a product of just a, a weak schedule, right? The strength of schedule wasn't very high. So was that a product of that or were they more legitimate than people think? And then, of course, we also talk about this 23 years old, you know, pretty old uh, for, for his class. Um, but listen, guys, all in all. There's a lot to like about this kid between his explosiveness, between his you know, finishing ability, his off the dribble scoring ability overall, his shot creating abilities, playmaking, shooting potential, and just his overall ability to put the ball in the basket. I think there's a decent upside to him. You know, he could potentially be a six man of the year candidate, fringe candidate. Um, somebody who needs work on defense, sure, needs to work on moving without the basketball, sure thing, um, you know, maybe improve a little bit as a passer, but the potential to be a good sixth man, come off the bench and give you 10 to 12 points, three, four assists, I think that's there, right? A decent ceiling with, with Grant Miller. Um, so yeah, listen, if the Knicks do decide to let Trier walk, this is your guy to look at, all right? And uh, that's it tonight, guys. I really don't have much else. Um, but yeah, we want our usual time, about 20, 25 minutes. Um, hope you guys enjoyed. This uh, This is it. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, probably going to cover... We got a couple more guys, actually. So maybe Marcus Howard. Maybe we'll dive into him more. Um, and then a few other guys. So that's, that's, that's pretty much it for tonight, though, guys. That's uh, Grant Riller for episode 122 of BD4. So I got you guys. I hope you enjoyed. You know, it's always good to have everybody tuning in, whoever. Um, you know, the criticism, the compliments, I, I accept it all and I appreciate it all. I appreciate everybody who stops by. So thank you so much. This is your host, Rob Carbone, signing out. Episode 124 Where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks, Yankees and Knicks analysis. I'll see you next time. All right, ciao.